Hello, everybody, and welcome back to the Canadian Intercollegiate Exhibition. My name is Shadi Hannum. I'm the head coach of esports at Keanu College in Fort McMurray, Alberta, and I am delighted to be hosting our panel today. Bring your parents to school. It's been a it's been a while since uh, maybe some of us in this uh, this call have done that, but we're ready here to do it again. Um, for everyone here in this Twitch chat um, that is interested in learning more about esports in school, um, scholastic esports at the elementary school, high school, or middle school and high school level. Um, and I've got some uh, absolute experts here to share um, their their wisdom and knowledge about the space uh, with you all today. So we'll start with some introductions. Carol, maybe if you could lead us off. Sure, actually, I'm representing the collegiate space. I'm a college professor who helps out with the uh, student-run esports club, and I offer work-integrated learning to students who want to learn more about esports. I'm also the recently started at Esports Canada as the CFO and board treasurer. But most important of all, I am the parent of two sons who both benefited from esports. So one took the collegiate and semi pro path, the other played professionally in a global league. So I can attest to all the good things that esports did for them. Great. Thank you, uh, Carol. Uh, Melissa, we'll have you go next. For sure. Uh, my name is Melissa Burns. I am the founder and chair and CEO of Esport Canada. Uh, I also am an educator and uh, work in Manitoba uh, as part of a school division, working as instructional support. So I'm a pedagogy expert and work on leveraging digital tools in the classroom to really improve uh, student outcomes. Awesome. Thank you so much, Melissa. And Travis, we'll have you bring it home. Yeah, my name is uh, Travis Bouchard. I work for a company called Academic and Athletic Development uh, that provides sports alternative programming to students uh, at elementary through high school at uh, two separate campuses. Uh, and so this year I was lucky enough to start uh, Vimy Esports and I'm the director of Vimy Esports. Um, and so our, our program is a uh, is an academy type thing where we have the the kids two blocks a day rather than a club or, or an after school sort of uh, situation uh and as uh same as carol there i'm also a parent uh i have a seven-year-old and a 10-year-old who are fast becoming uh very interested in video games and uh very interested in the esports space so uh, i'm uh, i've got a, a couple different viewpoints on on these topics excellent and i love that we have you know such great representation from all of these different age groups and involvement with the uh, scholastic and educational side of esports, because I think those are uh, very important areas to discuss and touch on. And, you know, I'm sure as we go through, um, chat will have questions. And so for today's uh, panel, uh, please don't hesitate to throw questions in the chat as you have them. I will be staring rather intently anytime you see me doing this. It's because I'm waiting for you guys. Um, so don't hesitate to ask your questions. And the panel here would be happy to um, respond to any of your questions. And feel free to direct your questions directly to a panelist if you have a specific question for them and their role and um, you know maybe how your child would interact with the programming at their level. We'll start off with um, a kind of as an introductory feeler question to um, spark some discussion around this. Uh, esports has often been cited as being um, an inclusive alternative to traditional extracurricular programming where, you know, certain programs seem to be catered towards one group of students or you have to have certain physical requirements or skill requirements or whatever. Esports is pretty all encompassing and there are very few restrictions or barriers to who can participate uh, in uh, esports uh, competition and activity. Um, how have you found like the inclusivity of esports to be um, you know, a strong selling point for you and your programs and how, how have you attempted to convey that message to parents? Um, Melissa, we'll start with you kind of at the younger side of the scale. Yeah, for sure. Um, I know I shared this earlier this week, but um, Entertainment Software Association of Canada had put together um, a report on numbers specific to Canada around um, participation in video gaming and esports um, that was released in uh, November of 2022. So this is Canadian data and quite recent. Um, and they do this study. It's an ongoing study. They do every couple of years that they produce um, new statistics and data. And it showed that students between the ages of 7 and 17, 89% of them are gaming every single day. Um, so we know that already from those numbers, which I would say even compared to the statistics coming out of the states, to me even seem almost a little bit low. I was expecting it to be in the 90s, um, but 89% is most of our students are doing this. 
We know that most of our students are engaging in gaming in one form or another. Um, and the reason that this is also really interesting is that they did a breakdown by gender as well, and it was binary gender. So it is not all encompassing of what the actual demographics are. But for a binary perspective, they did find that over 40% of those participating in games of that 89%, 40, over 40% 40 of them were identifying as female. Um, and so it's not something where we're looking at a specific segment of the population that's doing this. This is really all encompassing. And where this, I, I have found this particularly interesting in the school setting is that because this is something that all of our students do, it gives us the opportunity to have a really unique cross-section of students interact with each other who normally wouldn't. Because typically in a school mm -hmm. setting, you have students that are really interested in sports and go and participate in sports. You have students that are really interested in music or drama, they participate in mm -hmm. those activities. You have students that are really interested in art and photography, they go do those things. But nothing else really truly brings together a huge cross-section of interest the way esports does. And so it's really cool to see how when we bring those opportunities together in a school setting in very intentional ways, there is huge potential for us to use this as a tool for social learning and um, for personal and interpersonal development. I love that you touched on um, not just the um the age and gender, but also like the activity interests as well. Um, because, you know, when you look at those esport career pathways charts, they like expand and expand and expand and expand into so many different areas um, because yeah. there's so much, um, you know, commonality between uh, all of these different passions or interests that you might have as a kid and how you can connect that to gaming um, and the esports world. Uh, Travis, in your particular context uh you're not just working on inclusive inclusivity but also in legitimizing pathways for esport competition maybe you could touch on that and kind of in regards to including a new group of students um i i think one of the amazing things about esports uh, i mean i work in a school that has very uh, traditional sports we have hockey programs and lacrosse and all that kind of thing right um sometimes it can feel like esports the the breadth of the different esports you know you have you know, a whole bunch of different titles instead of one sport. I think that can be turned into an advantage, especially in this space, is that, you know, we're talking about um, individuals of all ages being able to participate and compete. So the fact that there's a Smash Bros or there's a Rocket League that can be for any age group, and, and then there's teen and mature games that you can play beyond that, um, I think that that's a, a huge advantage of esports, is that we can, we can tailor esports to a whole bunch of different age groups. And speaking of different age groups, Carol, I mean, kind of to close off the uh, the top end, um, you know, I, I we talk about gaming and the gamification of education as being ways to incentivize kids to stay in school and to pay attention in school and to, um, you know, want to uh, be excited to go to school. Um, and then naturally that leads to, you know, where do you go once you're done with high school? Um, what kinds of opportunities does the post-secondary uh, esports scene provide uh, for those high school graduates that have gone through these uh, esport programs at a younger age. Thanks. Yeah, there's so many different paths and routes they can take. So a school like yours that offers varsity, that's a fantastic um, opportunity for competitors. They're, let's say, incentivized to keep their grades up if they want to stay on the team. Mm -hmm. So that's a, a wonderful pathway for the, the competitive <clears throat> student. For the casual player, though, it's important that there's other, like you mentioned, career pathways so they can take a degree or diploma, particularly right now in Canada, marketing, management, event management, entrepreneurship are the key um, areas that we can see proper careers, esports, degrees and diplomas evolving. So I think that's a, an exciting pathway, but there's also the community side. So if you're a casually competitive player, you can join your team that's there and have a lot of opportunities to interact with other students and gain other life skills from participation in that. And then there's still the more casual player. If you just want to hang out online, to your earlier point, if you're online hanging out with students at your school, nobody knows who you are. So it's not um, gender specific. It's not are you athletic or not. It, it is for everybody because you have a shared interest. So not only do I go to this college or university, now I have all these online friends that I can interact with. So I think there's 
opportunities for everyone, no matter the level of their skill or their interest in esports. Yeah, casually competitive, I think, is my uh, my new favorite uh, catchphrase. That's I love that. Um, that that's our and, school. And I, and I think it, it touches on it touches on you know that 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 group of people that you know are obviously very passionate about their game, but not necessarily you know wanting to go pro or or be a professional player. And and uh, I, I think it's important for people to recognize you can be involved in esports without needing to be a pro player. Um, there are so many other ways to 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 benefit from that. You know, the same way that you might play soccer or basketball, but not have to be a professional soccer player or have to be a professional basketball player. There are other benefits uh, from that. Um, so why don't we touch on some of those benefits in particular? And maybe we'll, again, we'll kind of start young and grow our way up here. Uh, Melissa, to start with you. Um, what for are sure. some of the benefits for esport programming at the scholastic level? Well, I think something that has really stood out to me um, is just the shift the paradigm shift in society and how we interact with each other um, and how we've really seen that not even, it was definitely something that had already started prior to the pandemic, but it was definitely really um, accelerated throughout that experience where Gen Z is reporting just as many real life experiences in digital spaces as they are in physical spaces, which is not something that has traditionally been the case uh, in terms of expressing those kinds of experiences for older generations, myself included. Um, and so knowing that they're having these real life moments in digital spaces, my cousin's wedding being an example of that, where half of the guest list from his wedding, he was meeting in person for the first time at his wedding because he had been playing Call of Duty with them for years. Um, is that these are real friendships, these are real experiences, these are real people, and this is how we are interacting in this day and age, which is a beautiful thing because it really does make the world a lot smaller, and it provides so much opportunity for us to learn and experience from each other in ways that were not previously available to us, and certainly not in this kind of um, sort of ease. But with that also comes a lot of responsibility. Um, while we have all these possibilities and opportunities to really experience in very um, unique and beautiful ways, it's also something that we have to now look at a, as a learning experience and a teachable moment that needs to be done so with a lot of care and intention. We make a lot of assumptions as educators that our students, because they grow up with technology, that they know how to use it. And the example that I often give is that it's kind of like growing up in an English-speaking nation. If you grow up in an English-speaking nation, you are probably going to learn how to speak English. That kind of comes with it. These kids know how to use technology. But being able to learn how to read and write in English needs to be taught explicitly. If you don't explicitly teach reading and writing, some will have access, some will not. It won't be equitable. Some will be pick it up easier than others, and some will really struggle. Some will need more intervention to be successful in reading and writing. And we're seeing the same in digital spaces where we need to bring this into our schools in intentional ways because there is so much potential for them and they are experiencing things in real ways, but they need to have the skills to do that successfully. And so while there is tons of opportunity and benefit here, we also have a lot of responsibility in how we approach it. And so that's where these esports programs are really, really crucial, even at elementary schools where they're just learning some of those foundational skills. So the, the core the core concept here is that it needs to be intentional, the programming that you, yeah. you provide to your students is that it's not just sitting them in front of a computer screen and telling them to play video games. It's doing something deliberate with that time and trying to have, you know, achieve a, a particular outcome with that. Uh, Travis, you and I have talked, obviously, plenty of times off camera about, you know, some of your intentions with your programs and the goals that you've set for your players. And there's a question in chat here that I think actually segues really nicely with the topic we have at hand and, and, and your particular expertise. Um, uh, Chatter is asking, how uh, do you respond to some of the challenges that are proposed by traditional athletics, maybe not being as accepting of esports? And I think in your case, you're in a particularly interesting circumstance where you're the first uh, in all of Canada, surrounded by a very high-performing athletic program, and now you've got kids playing Rocket League in the morning. How do you how do you juggle that um, that that circumstance, that environment? 
Absolutely. Um, so uh, we have a very good uh, relationship with our administration. And, um, you know, you would think in a school like ours, or, or you could think that in a school like ours, that um, where our teachers are hockey players and they're on the ice <clears> with people and, and they're, they're very much traditional sports people, um, you'd think that maybe there might be a little bit of, you know, reticence to, to accept the esports guys as they come in or whatever, right? But I've seen kind of the opposite uh, you know some of our high-end hockey coaches have talked to us about how we teach our kids to communicate because if there's one thing a hockey coach wants is people communicating all over the ice right so um we've we've ha had a lot of luck with our staff being uh being great as far as that goes um we also are trying to teach our kids we're, we're building the foundation uh of them being proud of what they're doing right this is their passion uh be proud of it um try to be at the best level that you possibly can um and then on the other end of things we're we're building we're trying to build the legitimacy of uh esports in alberta we're trying to you know may, maybe take some things from the traditional sports world where you know provincials things like that and westerns and you know uh in a school like ours when you see those banners we you know we just got one for wrestling or, or for example uh, when there's an esports one up there, hopefully next year. Um, when there's an esports one up there, that that that's going to ring true with a lot of our athletics people and the you know the the student athletes in our school who who are playing the more traditional sports, right? So uh, try to build a foundation of our kids, make sure that they're they're proud of what they're doing, um, and then um, and then just keep building our, our our program, and and those things will come on their own. So you're you're uniting your program with that of you know your hockey academy and all of these other traditional athletic academies around this shared, this common interest as we were talking about earlier of yeah. the love of competition and yep. success and 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 being able to you know kind of demonstrate your skill above an, an opponent like that's a universal feeling between sport and esport. Absolutely, and I, I think that's one of the advantages that I have uh, personally is that I have an extensive. Um, you know, knowledge of the traditional sports world, uh, you know, coaching for years and, and things like that. So I kind of have a different perspective to somebody who maybe has been only in esports their whole life. So trying to meld those things together is uh, something mm -hmm. that I'm, I'm pretty passionate about. Mm -hmm. I, I want to take this conversation about challenges and benefits and, and pivot this now as we get into the, the post-secondary uh, era. You know, kids, obviously kids have homework to do and studying to do, but it becomes a lot more challenging when you hit that post-secondary level where you don't have a structured class time. You know, your professors or teachers aren't chasing after you to get your work done. You know, you have a lot more personal responsibility around your academics and your career future. How do you, as a college student, juggle your responsibilities, whether it be to your gaming club or your varsity team, with your academic commitments, Carol, if you have any thoughts or comments on that challenge um, of esports at post-secondary. It's funny, from a parent perspective, I think that's where a varsity school does a really good job working with the students. I mean, you could speak a little bit more to that as well, For because sure. they, there's more structure around it to assist the students like you see in a traditional sports program. <clears throat> a club-based school like the one I'm at, it really does fall more onto the students themselves to have that discipline, the time management. They're still going to compete on Wednesday night in whatever league that they're collegiate league they're involved in but they don't get those same uh, structure and supports. And that's maybe where the family does has to step in a little bit and help them with their time management skills as they're developing it. So a, a varsity one, I'm curious, what uh, supports do you have there that you can explain that they offer? For sure, yeah. I, I feel like sometimes when I do these panels, I forget that I have my own esports program that I can talk about. Um, so uh, at Keanu, uh, you know, we are a varsity program. Um, and what that means kind of in short form is um, we have a dedicated facility, we have academic benefits to our students, and that can range anywhere from scholarships to, um, you know, tutor, tutorship and, and um, support programs on campus, which we have both um, at Keanu. Um, and, and additionally, you had mentioned this earlier, but I did want to make it explicit is that we do have a GPA requirement to continue playing for our teams. So when you get recruited to our team, you're recruited um, not just based off of your skill, but also kind of your um, your talent as a as a student and your commitment as a student, uh, because if you fail to meet those GPA requirements, you're ineligible for competition in future terms. So like you said, there's an incentive to keep your grades up in order to keep playing and be able to participate in the high stakes competition and potentially win prizes and get all of the benefits of competition that, uh, that students crave. 
Um, but I do have to say, as someone that came from a club background, one of the benefits of the club environment that um, I think club esport programs do have, um, and, and in some cases even more so than varsity programs, is because they're so good at creating a positive and encouraging environment, you build really good friendships, sometimes with people in your classes and sometimes with, outside. Um, they're great for mental health and de-stressing and decompressing. And I think it, uh, those things do lend themselves to making you more productive as a student as well. Whereas sometimes, and it is important to note, because uh, you know, I think when we're having these conversations, we don't want to shy away from the the dangers or risks with esports. The competitive side of esports can be quite stressful. On the other hand, right, you have a lot of obligations to keep up with. You know, our teams are practicing four to five times a week. Yes, they're getting scholarships. Yes, they have tutors. But when you're practicing, you know, twenty to twenty five hours a week, your full time school, and some people are even working part time. That takes up quite a chunk of your week, right? Um, so the club, on the other hand, does give you some of those, you know, de-stressing space, spaces where, you know, you can kind of exert some of that um, that stress and hopefully recenter yourself before the next week begins. So, uh, you know, pros and cons really to kind of both models, but definitely post-secondary esports can can be a, um, a boon to your, uh, to your academics. Um, I think um, the you know the next space to kind of take this conversation uh, as I'm looking through some of these questions we actually just touched on a little bit uh, but a healthy balance between esports academics and physical activities so I'm actually gonna I'm gonna start this one with you Travis and then I want to shift up to Carol and I want to start with you because I want to get a sense of what does Vimy do as far as like a day plan for your students and what kinds of activities are they involved in throughout the day and what does you know we'll say the pinnacle of esport academic programming look like uh, in Canada. Yeah, so I think one of the the questions we get from parents are, uh, and it goes back to some stereotypes of video game players and, and esports and stuff like that, is um, you know how much physical activity they're doing, right? So um, we get more physical activity with our students than a normal junior high. <clears throat> um, so we generally like to put it, and uh, these are baselines. We usually try to put it forty to sixty percent of our time we're in the esports space and we're doing you know video reviews or, or playing the game or doing drills and things like that. And then the other forty to sixty percent we're doing physical activity. So um, they do their gym class through us. Uh, we have uh, esports specific fitness from our fitness director. Um, we're we're doing outside activities. Um, we're trying to find that balance. You know, especially at a uh, young age, we're trying to make sure that they're um that they're remaining active and that's kind of what our programs have always been built on so um our board of, of course was making sure that we made sure we had our health and wellness as, as a part of that um the other thing is is we kind of explained to our student athletes that like if you look at the high level players they're not showing up to their scrims and that's it and that's the end of things they have you know they're doing activity well they're working out in the gym they they have uh um, strength and conditioning people, they have um, psychologists, sports psychologists, things like that. It's not just how fast can you move a mouse or how good are you with the controller, it's uh, they're athletes now. So we make sure that uh, we treat our student athletes as athletes. Uh, I think uh, one of the major things that I was very, very happy with this year is that our, our fitness director was very excited about esports coming into our space and that goes back to our staff being very supportive. Um, she was very excited about esports coming into the space and so she took the time to look up like what are esports, you know, professional esports, what are, you know, um, younger esports student athletes, what are the things that they need, right? Um, so she talks a little bit more about, you know, we didn't do much bench pressing this year because at this point that's not really effective mm -hmm. to what their sport is, but mm -hmm. we, do, we do do posture things, we do do general fitness things so that we those things will affect their gameplay, right? So um, we definitely make sure that the physical component uh, of our of our um, program is once again in the the forty to sixty percent uh, of the time. Every time I'm on one of these panels and someone says posture, I like instinctively just like straighten up my back a little bit. I'm, I'm like, oh shoot, I caught myself slumping again. Um, no, that's the. I mean, I, that's great, and I love the way that you've kind of illustrated the. Uh, uh, the athleticism of esports. The other thing I wanted to jump in on too is uh, not a lot of people know this about professional organizations, but they oftentimes hire personalized chefs for their teams that are responsible for cooking them healthy, well-balanced meals. Um, so a diet of Mountain Dew and uh, Cool Ranch Doritos does not make you a professional esports player. Uh, <laughs> for any any parents in the chat that might be concerned about that. Um, yeah, go ahead, Carol, please. Oh, I was just going to say the pro teams also quite often has a physical trainer and a mental health coach as part of their staff as well. So right. there is um, an effort, and I think that goes really for something the parents can look at, is the role models that are out there. 
So if you can put out, well, look at this team, look at the effort they spend on making sure that their professionals are balancing out the physical exercise. Their professionals are actually meeting with the mental health coach. And let's talk about what does it mean to be tilted or how do you regulate your emotions? What if mm -hmm. you get frustrated? What do you do? And use those professional role models to help in those conversations. It, it definitely helps in our room. I'll tell you that. Like, I'm not going to lie. If, if the choice is between they get to play, you know, Rocket League for the rest of the day or, you know, it's time for us to go to the fitness center. There's not always 100%. Yes, let's go do this. This is a part of our day. But when you start talking about like, you can show them videos of whatever Sentinels from Valorant and you show them with their, you know, their psychologist or that, you know, you can show them that they're doing strength and conditioning. It's like, well, this is where you guys kind of want to be. So it's a little easier for us to, to maybe get them moving towards the fitness center in that, in that case. Oh, well, and one of the things please. that is really interesting too, if that if I can jump in for a second, for sure. is that while we know that there are lots of research studies that show the benefits of uh, physical activity on uh, game performance, and we've seen especially that there's a very strong correlation between strong cardiovascular health and your ability in FPS games specifically, there's a really interesting study that that outlines the correlation there, is that oftentimes we also forget that Esports, and this is a newer area of research, but there was a pretty large study that came out just last spring um, that looked at over 2,000 students in grade three from the US. Um, and they were looking at the physiological difference or impact that um, playing video games had on uh, their different kinds of responses. So they looked at things like short term memory, um, their, uh, uh, sorry, their, um, not perception. Oh, the word is escaping me. But they're oh, reflex, quick reflex. And then they also put them th uh, with the, while they did the test, they were also looking for um, any sort of physiological responses as well. In, in addition to these neurological responses, they were looking for physiological physiological responses. And they found that the students that played games more regularly actually had lower or sorry higher oxygen levels in their blood and a better stress response lower cortisol levels when they were doing this testing than the kids that weren't playing games regularly so it actually had a positive physiological response having played more games and that is something that we don't often hear about and we don't often talk about but this was a, a very interesting study that piqued my interest and I, I'm curious to see where this leads in future studies yeah, I uh, I shared a presentation earlier this year, actually at the uh, Manitoba Classic Esports um, Expo, um, it, back in May, about uh, gamers uh, displaying the lowest levels of neuroticism when confronted with stress, um, and how some people were arguing that that makes them just as qualified in some cases as like pilots when it comes to flying drones and planes. And I know that's a bit of a controversial topic, so we don't need to deep dive into that <laughs> today. But the concept being that, you know, because you're so used to these high stress environments and you've become accustomed and adapted to that, um, is that you're 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 suited for that when it you transfer outside of the gaming world into uh, the career world and you know you might be in a job that's particularly stressful and you've kind of trained and prepared for that as well. Um, I, I was jumping in earlier because I wanted to push this to Carol because she specifically indicated wanting to touch on how moms and dads can support their kids in esports and being a mom of a pro gamer I'm sure you have quite a bit to share and comments on that. Uh, so I'd love to hear your thoughts from mom looking in how, what is that relationship like with your your child as they're pursuing their um, professional career in gaming and how do you support their healthy balanced lifestyle so that's a huge um bald unravel there there's so much in that one but i think the the biggest the biggest message i have is communication you have to show an interest i know when my son started he sat me down made me watch some matches well to be honest again the first couple of times i was watching in this time it was csgo back then no clue what was going on he walked me through, he explained it all. I watched the millions of people watching and thought, huh, I guess I should figure out what's going on here. Not just because my kid is interested, but because it's something that's going on in the world. So I think that letting the child be the expert, having them do the teaching, it doesn't mean, and I honestly, I cannot move a mouse for the life of me. So I'm not a good one to play with my kids, which is sometimes given as advice. It doesn't work for me. But I think that's a really big part of it. Another big part of it is as, as part of the parent doing the learning is understanding how the whole system works, because there's going to be a lot of compromises that have to happen in a family. 
So gameplay, you can't tell somebody who's playing with nine other people, oh, I'm sorry, it's dinner time, you have to leave now. So those are some of the like life lessons, I guess, I learned from this by hearing what my child explained, say, no, no, I've managed to get nine other people into the lobby. We're going to play now. Can I make dinner half an hour later? Well, as a parent, what am I supposed to say to that? Other than, thanks for planning ahead of time. That sounds great. You know, we'll eat at that time. Or don't start a match until you check before dinner. So I think a lot of this comes down to um, communication, as well as setting some sort of family boundaries and rules. So one of the things we talked, you mentioned earlier was uh, eating, healthy eating. So my house, we had gamer snacks. My husband was an absolute deer making bowls full of fruit. So they could take a fork, they could eat it, didn't make the keyboard messy, didn't make their mouse messy, but that was our habit. After dinner, you went down, you're going to game, you take a bowl of fruit with you. And that just becomes part of it. And I love that I'm seeing what I was talking about, bringing in the role models from industry. Team Denmark, Vancouver Titans are now posting, I don't know, food shots of all their different snacks. So they're bragging about, hey, look at this fruit plate we just made our players, or look at this healthy dinner we just ate. So I think there's a lot that parents can leverage, not with only their own actions, you know, make them a fruit plate, or showing them that this is what other people are eating instead of let's haul in the cases of energy drinks into the house. So I think a lot of what we can do to support them is this first parents getting educated and then using what they learned about that world and bringing in the good stuff into their home environment. I love the gamer snacks. That's so cool. That's a really, really cool idea. Um, I may have just written that down just for my own house. So. <laughs> that's, that's a super awesome idea. Um, you said something. I literally just had it on the tip of my tongue and totally left my brain. Um, but you had said something about, um, oh yeah, uh, about showing interest and excitement and involvement in kind of your your kids' passions. Uh, similar story for me. Um, my brother played his first collegiate game, uh, collegiate uh, Overwatch game ever uh, on Saturday, um, and I brought my parents into the Keanu Esports Arena and I sat them down in front of the TV and they watched for the first time. Um, and you know those kinds of things I think are super important. And even just being able to tell my brother, "Hey, mom and dad are watching," was like super big for him, um, for him to like be able to experience that. Um, so it's incredibly empowering for them as well, um, uh, for for players to know that their parents are invested um, in what it is that they're doing. Um, when we talk about you know health and safety, um, you know there's also this additional element of safety, um, which is you know your online safety. We've talked about your safety kind of in in your physical health and maybe even in your your community at school and you know feeling trusted and supported by your administration and by other students and your classmates or whatever. Uh, but there's also this additional risk with esports, which is this online world, the scary, scary online world. Um, so Melissa, I wanted to pass this off to you, maybe to get some of your thoughts on how um, as a parent in the um, in the new age of media, um, can you help your children protect themselves um, when they're gaming online and utilizing online services to uh, facilitate their gaming? Yeah, uh, you know what? I'm gonna steal a line from Carol on this one. It comes down to communication. Um, I think that being really open with your communication, being involved in your children's gaming is really, really important. Um, I know for myself, my kids are a little bit younger than Travis's. I've got a seven-year-old and a four-year-old, but with my seven-year-old, um, he is starting to play online and we are doing so in a way that we talk about it. We talk about what he's experiencing. We are there with him when he's gaming. And it doesn't mean that we are becoming helicopter parents and sitting over his shoulder the whole time and like turning the game off as soon as someone talks to him. Uh, it is certainly not like that, but building a relationship with him so that he knows that we trust him to let us know when things are happening, having those open lines of communication, knowing that um, it's a judgment-free zone and that if something happens, we want him to feel safe and comfortable to come talk to us about it. So I think that that's a really important thing that we can do as parents. Um, and it's, and like, in some cases you can play with your kids in some cases you can't and so i am also terrible at fps games so uh if my son starts <laughs> gaining an interest in fps i will definitely watch i will probably not be playing with him but right now he's interested in mobas so sitting down and playing some pokemon unite with him is right up my alley and i love when he calls shots for us and says mom i'm gonna come gank for you it's great um 
But from the school perspective, and, and I think that this is where parents can become advocates in those spaces and they can really speak up to um, speak to the administration and speak to the teachers in that space to to advocate for safe environments is that we need to look at um, how are these gaming spaces being structured within the school? Um, how are they being intentionally created to um, create safe places where uh, students want to participate? Um, one of the areas that is particularly interesting to me is looking at creating spaces where uh, middle-aged girls and um, gender diverse folks can feel safe and comfortable gaming. Um, because I know from my own experience, when I had started coaching esports at middle years in 2016, um, it was 18 boys and two girls. And in my second year, it was the same thing. And I thought I was creating a safe space for my gender diverse and female gamers to come by simply just being female myself. It wasn't a guy teacher doing the guy stereotypically guy oriented activity. I thought that by me being a role model in that space that they would come and they didn't. I found that very interesting. And so the following year, my third year, I switched the strategy and I offered a separate, like I always had the, the open gaming day where we had everybody there, but I also had um, a gender diverse and female gamers only day. And the number of female and gender diverse equaled and then surpassed those that were participating in the co-ed setting. And as time went on throughout the year, more and more of those folks that were in the gender diverse and female gaming setting were feeling comfortable and confident to then participate in the co-ed setting as well. And so we need to look at if you are noticing these huge um, differences in your demographics, knowing that the data shows that just as many girls and gender diverse are gaming as, as boys, then why are they not showing up in those kinds of settings? And how do we change the setting? We always talk about if a student is not flourishing, it's not the student that's the problem, it's the environment. You don't blame the flower for not blooming. You look at, well, is it being watered? Is it getting too much sun? Is it not getting enough sun? We change the environment to help the flower bloom and grow and flourish. And we want to do the same for our students. Um, from an administrative and uh, policy perspective, we need to look at things, uh, especially in a school-based setting, where we are taking student safety, privacy data very seriously. Um, and that is something that we are entrusted with and need to take seriously. And so when we are doing, providing these opportunities, these very valuable opportunities for students to gain, we need to do our due diligence to make sure that we are following terms of services. We are following privacy policies. We are looking at compliance to the city the standards within our school districts and our school boards. And if there isn't, if there is some sort of um, dis, uh, discrepancy between those two, looking for creative solutions that maintain the security of the environment and the safety of the environment for our students to participate. So it's balancing those two things and, and making sure that we are not just removing the opportunity, but that we are finding ways to do so that are equitable. That was a very thorough answer. I'm trying to see if I can like pick out like one or two things to like <laughs> Sorry. latch on. No, it's it's good. I, I'll ask I'll ask Melissa a question and she'll answer 17 questions that I didn't even know I had as well. Um, no, I I think it's a really interesting conversation about um, creating separate spaces. I mean, yesterday, yesterday, yeah, we talked about um, a similar concept, but for age um, and having like running that fine line between creating a catered experience versus gatekeeping or segregating right in our programming um but i do think that when it comes to is particularly the question of gender because st stereotypically for so long gaming has been a boys club a boys activity um that you know in order to change that narrative you need to be a little intentional about um about how you want to do that um I, I think just to kind of switch gears here just a slightly as we talk about mentorship and coaching, because you did mention, you know, your role as a coach, um, Melissa, and catering specifically to, um, uh, you know, to everyone really, but also being really intentional about wanting to have girls and, and marginalized genders, um, uh, gendered people participating um, in your programming. 
uh, that role of coaching and mentorship in esports is, I think, a crucial differentiating factor between gaming and esports, right? Um, and I think, Travis, maybe you could jump in and touch on a little bit about what does that look like in an esports context? What does it mean to coach esports? And why is that mentorship and positive role modeling so important? Yeah, I mean, uh, a lot of, you know, the answers to my questions here, we, we talk about, um, we talk about communication and we talk about, um, we talk about how we're going to teach our kids that, uh, that maybe don't have the, the traditional sports experience. Um, so some of the esports kids, they're not, some of them um, might not be on hockey teams or baseball teams. Maybe that's not something that's of interest to them. Uh, I think one of the major things that we teach them and we provide them is we give them an opportunity to compete uh, and to have those uh, opportunities for uh, facing adversity, for problem solving on the fly, um, and things like that. So I think I am an absolute, like I, my passion right now is for uh, building the team communication and, and things like that within our room. Um, I think that's been a major uh, win for us this year. If you would have heard our kids at the beginning of the year when we said, hey, we're going to jump into game now. We're, we're teaching them what, you know, what Rocket League is. We get them in the game and either you hear nothing or you hear like they're talking about what happened at, you know, the first block, right? Um, whereas by the end of the year, you're getting to the point where you're more efficient with your communication. There's a, there's almost a hierarchy of, of who's speaking the most, like an in-game leader in Valorant and things like that. Um, I think teaching them those skills and uh, and maybe taking some things from the the traditional uh, the traditional sports world as far as being uh, in a team dynamic and, and learning how to communicate with their teams and, and everything like that. I think that is a massive thing that an esports coach can uh, teach their student athletes. Realized I was uh, needed on Discord. You touched on uh, communication there um, as being like a really crucial skill set, and I think it's one of the ones that um, we kind of gravitate to when we talk about the benefits of esports. Because especially for a game like Rocket League, which I know you guys specialize in at Bimmy, the game is so fast paced and, and infinitely more so than a traditional sport. You know, soccer a game is ninety minutes, and Rocket League it's five. Right, so you've got to be talking a lot faster maybe in communicating information a lot more quickly than you would in the 90, 90 minute game of soccer um and carol you had touched on communication particularly between yourself um and your child as being an important factor in um in their involvement um in esports um what maybe if you could illustrate more specifically like what that attention to detail as far as teaching those communication skills looks like at home. Um, I mean, you gave such a, a great example with the bowl of fruit. I'm trying to see if you can get a bowl of fruit for communication uh, as well, if you've got anything, uh, got anything there to share. I think there's a couple of ways the answer on this one can go. I think one of them is I think parents have to be the role models here. So there are a lot of parents now who game and when they're gaming, how they behave, what they do, so if they have a routine of, it might sound a little awkward, but uh, talking to a couple of people and they, they do this, is that they actually go and make an intentional stretching session before they start to play. Then they um, get water, not an energy drink, bring it in so they make it like a fitness thing that they're doing. And then I think you could take that to communications as well. You should know that their young people are listening all the time. So if you're not regulating your emotions very well, the young folks are hearing that. And um, so communication that you do as a model for your young person will be um, an important part of it. A second answer to this one will also just be the, the conversations that you're having internally um, at home just about the game themselves. You know, when they finish a game, you're talking about, well, what happened? How did you feel when that happened? What did you do when so-and-so said whatever they said? Or somebody said something inappropriate. How did you react? What are you going to do about it? So I think those family dinner time conversations can expand into something that interests the child. How, you know, how was, instead of coming, you know, husband or wife comes home and says, hey, how was your day, dear? Instead is, how was your game? And then break it down. What were they excited about it? And then pick up on those communication items that you're you're mentioning that you can guide them a little bit oh is that the right way to say it or i see you're really frustrated by that why don't you just you know step away from the keyboard for a sec 
take a little bit of a walk. Let's talk about this for a sec and, and go back online. So just tell them that you're going to be AFK for five minutes. Let's just take a moment and, and, and deal with this. So I think the parents can be involved without, um, I think Melissa, you're saying you don't want to become a helicopter parent in all of this, but you do have to be engaged and interested in what they're saying. If they're using words like tilted, well, it really helps for a parent to know that maybe that's not a good thing. So that's one of those words you should be listening for. And then talking about, well, what do we do when you're experiencing those kinds of emotions? So I think there's a lot of, again, communications that without knowing the game, as a parent, you're not the coach, but you are there to support them in a lot of other ways. So you said something, and then my mind started racing to see if I could find exactly what I'm looking for, because we're talking about communication, and I figured an essential, crucial part of communication is knowing the language of gaming. And I remember once I'd seen a guide that was like a parent's guide to eSport terminology, and it was like, what the heck is AFK? Yeah, Carol. You know who's got a really great one? It's one of the, I love to support them, the British eSports Association. All right, let's look They have up. some very good parent resources. I think that was another question that was in there that we might get to or not, but they have a lot of parent resources and they have a guide to gaming and they have some glossaries and things like that that cover a lot of those. And you're right, like AFK, that's not a bad word. <laughs> but if you yeah. don't know esports, you don't know that AFK is just away from keyboard. It's it's not a big deal. And honestly, you can get a lot of cred with the kids if you can just throw in an occasional word. Yet you can regain a little bit of hitness as a parent too if you can uh, communicate just using a few uh, of those um keywords and you know, knowing what role does your child play you know if they had an alt is that a good thing or a bad thing <laughs> um you know that you're just not yes. completely lost again you don't have to know all the nuances but just to be able to communicate with them in their language and the language of esports is is valuable so I did find these, uh, sorry, I'm just posting it in Twitch chat really quick. I did find the parents guide, but I can't find the language guide on it. So I'll continue looking. Um, okay. Go ahead. Uh, I think uh, just to jump on it, like one of the things that I think is I'm really lucky uh, with is uh, uh, we're in a room full of, you know, 20 kids in here who are gaming with all those conversations going on. So we can be very intentional of like, okay, we heard the way you just said, uh, I need you to rotate here. And you said it three times and you got angry by the end of it. It's like, is that going to get somebody to want to play with you? Uh, does that person want to do the thing or are they going to dig their heels in, right? So we can, we get to have those conversations and, and once again, very passionate about it, very excited about uh, the the improvement in our communication as we went. So I, I do uh, echo the things that Carol was saying that like, you can listen to the way that they're saying things and even just... Maybe you're not their coach, but in that moment, you could be their parent of just like, in life, if you talk to somebody and you, you're you going really hard at them, they're going to dig their heels in. If you can work with somebody, you're going to get better results, right? And it's very similar. Like this applies even before they get into the competitive esports when the kids are playing Roblox and, and Minecraft and Fortnite. And like, if someone goes up and like blows up your bill, Having that conversation, because your kid will tell you about it. If someone blows up their build, they will tell you. You will hear about it. But then you get to follow that up with, so what did you do? And then listen for the response and then have the conversation about how they responded and how did it make them feel when they first had that happen to them? And how does it make them, how do you think it makes the other person feel depending on how they've responded as well? Yeah, I love the what did you do about it response. I think it's great because it reminds them that they're ultimately in control, maybe if not of the situation, but of their response to the situation as well. <clears throat> and that's a great um, thing to note. Um, we're in the kind of latter half uh, of the conversation here. Um, so I did want to give an opportunity, um, you know, maybe to kind of spark some last minute discussion, uh, maybe with some final thoughts or suggestions or best practices for parents. So again, we'll start kind of at the younger age and build our way up. Uh, so Melissa, you know, working with that, um, we'll say K to seven, K to eight range, um, you know, how are you as a teacher and a leader and, and as a parent, um, you know, setting an example for, for students and what advice do you have for other parents who also wish to uh, be good role models for um, their their children who game? Mm -hmm. uh, I'd say develop an interest in what your kids love. Start there, pay attention, listen, um, and make sure that you are validating their experiences, their uh, feelings, their passions, their interests. 
um, and, and don't just pass it off as, well, they're just gaming. Um, so really making sure that you are listening, you are aware, and then try to become involved. If that doesn't mean playing with your kids, that's totally fine. But make sure that you are becoming involved by asking questions about it, watching them play, um, having those conversations around it and creating a relationship that is um, full of trust and respect for for the students so that they they know that they are seen and heard and validated in the experiences and the passions that they have. And Travis, carrying on that line of thinking, because you get into the middle and high school level, um, you know, I, again, as a coach and a parent, where are you kind of, uh, what are your, what have you gained in that experience that you think you could share with, uh, with chat? I think uh, Carol and Melissa have really touched on it. I think the foundation is that recognizing esports as a legitimate, you know, hobby, uh, pathway to so many different careers, uh, pathway to scholarships, and, and just understanding that it's a legitimate thing and your kids will realize that, you know, you're treating it as such and then you're on the same level and you can you can have a conversation from there. Um, I'm, I'm taking you off the rails a little bit here. The other, <laughs> the other advice I would give parents is there's there's lots of local things if you're not, if you don't know that much, I mean, if you're listening to this, you've obviously had some sort of um, interest in esports. Your your kids are getting there, so you know you're taking it as a legitimate thing. You're looking for resources. Um, I'm maybe touch on some Alberta things, but there's going to be things in other provinces. Uh, Alberta esports uh, did an esports expo this year, uh, just a free event for people to come figure out uh, what esports is and and. Uh, and see some competition in person and and a lot of people hadn't seen that maybe someone who's a director of an esports program hadn't sat down and seen a big event before um so it was you know eye-opening for me there's going to be something that like that locally there's a uh, at kdays this year uh, which is a festival in edmonton there's a game developer thing there as well um there's going to be something local where you can uh take your your children to that as well and learn about uh, what esports is together and i think that sets you off uh, pretty well there yeah i just uh threw a link in chat um i, I hope people can see it because they were saying they can't see my last one um but it says uh, it's the esport canada link to uh their provincial partners as well um so you know there might be something locally like if you're in alberta we don't have a uh, alberta scholastic esports association for k-12 to yet uh, but yeah. you do have schools like Vimy, um, and you do have some other schools in the province yeah. that are engaged in esports. Um, but particularly Manitoba and Ontario have um, partnered um, organizations. And as I learned yesterday, um, all over the country, uh, esport organizations at this classic level are popping up. Um, so take a look I, there. I will say just one more thing to jump on because you you got the the, sure. mind, the mind running there. Selfishly, of course, I would you know say that there's programs like ours that exist. Um, I took no less than 20 different meetings this year from different schools in, around Alberta that are building their own clubs, they're building their own classes, um, you know, like an option class or, or something like that. There's other academies that are being built. Um, and so if you're part of a parent association or, you know, you uh, have contact with admin at a school, you can be finding out what's going on at the school. Maybe there's some opportunities that you don't know about and uh, another way to uh, turn what might be well, I'll use Carol's thing, casually competitive games that are, maybe we're working it into a team sport and esport, right? So uh, there will be those opportunities if, you, if you're looking for them. And, and I'm telling you, it's <laughs> it's absolutely blowing up in Alberta, and I would expect that it's it's blowing up everywhere else. Perfect. And Carol, lastly, kind of at that collegiate level, um, and, you know, even just drawing on your experiences as a, a parent of, uh, of two pretty accomplished gamers, um, what's your advice to the um, to the audience for today? there's life after the teenage years so in other words i mean when you're the parent of a teenager you get awfully worried saying oh my goodness my sons are giving up their team sports they're giving up their physical sports because they really want to go pro or they really want to spend more time on esports and your heart drops and you think oh my goodness what are they doing with their lives well a lot um they're doing well they thrive uh research is showing I, I found one stat from Lee and Steincooler. They say there's no significant relationship between gameplay hours and GPA. Gaming up to 14 hours weekly showed no relationship with the GPA at all. So if there's a family balance that happens here, if there's a plan, you do 
like Shadi, you've either got coaches at the collegiate level that help people come up with those schedules. If you're not doing it through a varsity, well then at home, are we, you know, keep up your grades, do all of those things. Well, you, first of all, you can, and let them go as far as they can in esports or where they want to go in esports. There is time later on. I'm a college ex educator. So I should be that first person saying, oh no, as soon as you finish high school, you've got to go off to college or university. No, you don't. You can have a gap year. You can have a gap two year. My son had a gap three year, right? He played pro for three years. He went back to school and started a completely normal career outside of esports. So just because a teenager is saying, oh, I'm so excited about esports. You know what the answer is? That's fantastic. Do what you can with it. Take it as far as you can go. Enjoy it. Then you can go back to school later. You can finish up a degree or whatever, or not, depending on where your career takes you. But it's not this, um, oh my gosh, how can you let your kids play video games? It's not that anymore. There's an entire, it's a normal life that happens. They got full careers, all sorts of the industry they can go into. And as I say, only one of mine ended up staying sort of related to esports. The other one finally was like his life outside of that as well. So it's it's a great time to be able to engage, particularly in that teen years, right? It's it's a really hard time to connect with people at that age and stage. So if you can get into their gaming even just a little bit and, and give them the tools they need to be successful, um, it's like there there is life on the other side. My um, I'll, I'll close with a little a little anecdote for for any parents still. Uh, in the chat, my uh, I've coached for five, four to five years now. I've been gaming since I was um, just starting. I mean, I've been gaming since I was six years old, but esports since I was in middle school. Um, and so far to this day, my all time favorite moment in esports was as a League of Legends coach at the University of Rio Grande um, in Southern Ohio, uh, where we're playing our semifinals game. And one of my players posts in our shared like chat server, uh, he posts a, a screenshot of his mom's text messages to him. And it's like 30 to 40 text messages back, basically like live tweeting the game to him being like, who was that? Was that character? Oh, go get him. Like they're taking your tower. What are you doing? Like it was this long, just <laughs> chat message and just the pure like excitement and enjoyment and just seeing how invested she was and what her kid was doing. Um, and, you know, you could tell that he really felt that and appreciated that. He was one of the strongest players of our team. Um, and having that support from your family is so crucial to being able to um, keep up, especially at the collegiate level uh, with, you know, your academics and your study. You know, he was the hardest working kid I ever had in my team. And and you can't, uh, you can't attribute that to anything else other than the fact that of how supported he felt and what it was that he was doing. Um, so uh, my what I always tell parents when I meet them the first, and they say, oh, my kid loves to play video games. The first question I always ask them, is, what games, what positions do they play? And so often I'm disappointed by parents that, oh, I don't know. But I'm hoping that the next future generation of parents can not only tell you what their kids play, but who they play in those games and how frequently they play and what positions they play the same way that you would know about your your son's hockey career you know your daughter's basketball career whatever it is right that same level of investment um, and commitment uh, to their interests um, so to round up to this conversation thank you so much everybody for sharing everything that you had uh, you had to share it was uh, super enlightening even for me I always learn something new whenever I talk to this group of people so thank you so much for uh, for your time and uh, and for sharing your knowledge um, I'm sure I'm sure everyone in chat enjoyed learning from you all today, and uh, I don't want to impose on anybody, but we're all pretty active on social media. So if you do have follow up questions or you're curious to learn more about what each of us does individually or 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 even just as a parent or someone that works with children about uh, in esports wanting to help them, you know, achieve their fullest potential, uh, don't hesitate to reach out to us. I believe our it looks like somebody already posted our Twitter links in chat. So uh, go ahead and click those links and give us all a follow and uh, we'd love to continue the conversation off site. Uh, thank you again, everybody for tuning into today's stream and we'll see you later this afternoon for some collegiate Valorant.